Hello, and welcome to another episode of LGOTV Big Talk. And why Big Talk? Because I hate small talk. Now, my guest today is an expert in talking big talk, small talk, all the talk. She is a relationship expert. Rachel D'Alto is a communication and re relationship expert, media personality, and speaker. She's the author of a great book, Relatable, How to Connect with Anyone, Anywhere. And this is my favorite part. The subtitle is Even If It Scares You. She has appeared as the relationship expert on Lifetime's Married at First Sight and TLC's Kate Plus Dates. Rachel D'Alto maintains a law degree and a master's in psychology. And in addition to uh, regular appearances, she's also been featured on over 200 national media outlets and has given not one, not two, but three TEDx talks, including Being Authentic in a Filtered World, which has been featured on TED.com. Rachel, welcome to Big Talk. Hey, it's so great to finally be here. I feel like I've been so excited about meeting you and, and really connecting more. So happy uh, to be here. Oh, that is so kind of you to say. So I am, I just want to put out there a raging introvert. So <laughs> seeing your title, Relatable, How to Connect with Anyone Anywhere, even if it scares you. Rachel, I have to tell you, if I am going to pick up the phone and like do takeout sushi order. Like I have to gear myself up, like the energy to talk to another human. And I think a lot of us over the course of the last couple of years in this pandemic, even if we did have good social skills, have kind of lost a little bit of like how to people. How do I people? I don't know how to people. So um, your timing of your book uh, could not be better to teach us all how to connect with people, to reconnect with people, to go deeper. So, but before we get into that, and I know a lot of people are like, okay, chief relationship, chief dating officer, match.com, all these things. This is about relationships, romantic relationships. This is about everything, right? It's about personal, interpersonal, family, romantic, professional, how to be relatable across all the different areas in life, right? 100%. And, and that's what I've always said is, yes, there's been a lot of my TV career has been about romantic relationships, but the foundation of relationships are all the same. The building blocks are all the same. And so all of these principles that we talk about in terms of being relatable can apply to your friendships, to your professional relationships, to people you don't want to have to have a relationship with, but you have to, so it's those, those family relationships. So across the board, that foundation is, does not change. It's just how how close do you get? <laughs> how much do you hug? <laughs> Could change with the dynamic. Yeah. So, okay. Your book starts off with an introduction with a hilarious story about how you were on the playground, like in elementary school and everybody else had friends and they were like playing together and like knowing how to people. And you were like picking off the heads of the dandelions. You were, you know, like that kid, that weird girl in the corner. I was that weird girl in the corner. <laughs> I went to computer sleepaway camp when I was 13. I was one of three girls in the entire camp and I still didn't kiss a boy till I went to college. So like, you know, not a pretty picture. So how do you go from that to becoming an expert in relationships? I think we learn through our greatest pain points. <laughs> and yes. So that was, the, you know, if you hit bottom at a young age, you can only get up from there. So uh, yeah, I had a lot of troubles when I was younger, bullying and, and really was isolated and lonely. And I found that so much of that affected my self-esteem, my self-worth. And I utilized so many of those lessons that I learned at a very young age and built upon them. And not to say that I had it all figured out by high school, it still took me probably until around my 30s where I thought, oh no, now I get it. Like now I can now reflect upon all of those experiences and now can be grateful for them because not only the, did they humble me, but they showed me kind of those pain points. And they showed me those, I call them confidence shaped holes where this really does get in the way of relationships. And so I do believe that, uh, you know, our pain's our greatest teacher. And so I've had a lot of teaching moments throughout my life. And, and that is what enables me to really assess things from that, that bird's eye view and, and help people. You know, I've always thought that um, the greatest adults are the latest bloomers, you know, like the ones who did really well, who like knew how to be people, knew how to social in high school, in junior high school. Like, they didn't have to work that hard to become mm. interesting. And so they didn't become that interesting. And I'm now, you know, 107 years old. So I've gone to a <laughs> lot of high school reunions. Um, and what I've noticed is that those of us who were, you know, the meeks and the geeks and the freaks, like we all did pretty good and like the captain of this team and the head of that club and whatever not quite 
not quite as great. And do you see in terms of knowing how to have relationships and actually be able to become a good talker and a good listener that maybe it is those pain points that become that shaping bit of us? Absolutely. And it's it's very interesting because there's, there's a couple of things that play. There's that resilience that mm-hmm. is something that people who are going through challenges have to grow uh, in if they want to survive those those challenges. But it's also, I do believe in the humility of it. And when you are in a position in your life where you are the out person, when you are ostracized, when you are bullied, whatever it is, and not to say that, you know, these are all benefits, but they really do create this level of humility. And I think you show up differently because of it. And I think there's a there's a built in empathy that can occur because of those experiences. And so oftentimes when I'm talking to people and they're saying, you know, and there's there's varying relationships that that I've worked with people on and whether it's professional, personal or romantic, oftentimes those who are more humble and have been humbled by life in the past show up differently. They show up with with a desire to grow. They show up with a desire to understand. And instead of just, you know, with this pomp of, you know, I I am right and I know what I'm doing, which many people who've never been pushed down before do, uh, it's just a very different approach to relationships and it benefits them. So yay for pain. <laughs> yay for pain. But I think that there is, there. I think that there's a stop on the train before we get to empathy. Um, and, and that may be armor. Or, mm. and, and that armor, I think, comes in the form of a lot of different things, right? It Maybe it comes from becoming a bully yourself, right? Hurt people, hurt people. Sure. Um, maybe it comes in the form of sarcasm. For me, I became very sarcastic. And I, right, I, <laughs> I, I, I developed a super quick wit, yes. but man, did it have a bite, right? Because my thinking was like, if I could hurt you before you could hurt me, or if I could put up a wall before you pierced me, or if I could just, if I, like a good, a good offense is a good defense, right? Mm. And so it took me years, 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 decades to get to a place where I was really comfortable being open and vulnerable and saying just simple things like, I don't know, or even asking questions, right? Like a lot of times we come in and we're just like full frontal words going forward because we don't want to show. And so you talk a lot about being vulnerable as a way to quickly get into that, you know, big talk into the stuff that really matters. So how do we how do we do that? How do we sort of pull, um, how do we, you know, we all have this like little inner child inside of us that's like afraid to be hurt. So how do we like let him or her or them know that we're okay so that we can be vulnerable and that it's not going to be the end of the world? It's definitely a two-step because first you have to be aware enough of where you show up on that vulnerability scale. Where mm-hmm. where do I naturally fall? And like you said, you know, there was times in your life where you would have been at one to ten at a one versus you know versus this ten, which would be super open and, and willing to share. And so I think we've all gone through those those levels. And so self-awareness is the the first key of just understanding how I show up now so that I can assess how to grow. And I think that's where when people say, just go out and be vulnerable, go share this, that's assuming that you're at a seven and you could go to a 10. But if you're showing up at a one and you're still scared and you have those moments of, you know, feeling that that intense fear, I'm not asking you to come out and, and be sharing your soul with people. So once you figure out where you are, then figure out what that next step is. And the inner child work is so important. It's something that I've studied and I believe so wholeheartedly in speaking to your inner child and reminding yourself, we all are all human. And I the problem is, is oftentimes when we talk about vulnerability, there's so much fear around it and there's so much fear of getting hurt. And we still need to remind ourselves and ourselves include all the variations of of inner children that have been hurt in the past that it's okay to take that next step. And I believe in baby steps. I believe in in taking one step at a time. What was that movie? Was that Billy Crystal? I'm going to date myself right now. Where he's, he was the therapist and he had, every, he had the client do the baby steps and they just kept repeating the mantra of baby steps. That's what I want for people because we don't need to throw people in the deep end of the pool and hope that they swim. That all, all that does is create a fear response. So take yeah. that baby step. What's that next step for you based on where you assess yourself now? 
Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I've been thinking a lot lately about this idea of rejection. Um, and, you know, we we talked before we started recording about, you know, our kids going through the college admission process and that fear of rejection. And, you know, I've spent, I spent the weekend, as I mentioned, driving all over creation uh, with, with my son looking at schools. And this, this, I just, I just, feel so badly for a lot of these students because they are dealing with a rejection at a moment when they're like, this is who I am. Please accept me or reject me at a moment when they're like 16, 17, 18, they don't have full frontal lobes. It's still so formative. So we have a lot of moments in our young life, whether it's literally being thrown into the deep end of the pool, as I my parents did to me to quote unquote drown proof you as a kid, or, you know, just like pranks that friends play on each other, but like you kind of are like, did they really mean it? I don't really know. And there's like a lot of this pain that we have in here, this sort of fear of rejection. But, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, in the beginning that this book is for all types of relationships, whether it's whether it's romantic, whether it's business, sometimes the relationships, people we don't necessarily want to have relationships with, but we have to. So, but I think rejection feels the same, whether it's a love interest, whether it's a college admission, whether it's, you know, a boss, whether it's a friend. Can we talk a little bit about rejection and how we can sort of get comfortable in this moment? Like you want to be relatable, so you have to show yourself, but that also means absolutely rejection might be coming. Yeah. Rejection is a, is a part of life, unfortunately. And, it, and it's really how we react to it that can change how we allow it to, to affect us. And not always can we control that reaction in the instant. And that's why I just want to let everybody know if you've ever had a complete breakdown because of a rejection, whether it's from a school, which yes, I, I feel you on that one. So I still remember my rejection from college. Yes. <laughs> I am I am old <laughs> and I, I could bring, I, I know the car I was driving, I knew I was wearing I remember the tears coming down my eyes as I was approaching a stoplight and almost went through it. Uh, so that could have gone even worse. But I do. It's it's all of those moments are so painful. So one, it's okay to not be okay when you're rejected. The challenge is, is, is picking yourself back up, is being willing to take the risk again. And that's really weighing out, I, it, really utilizing kind of our practical side of our brains to say risk versus reward. I could theoretically take that rejection and shut down forever. But what is the end result of that? And the ROI on actually taking that step again, knowing that at some point we could have success on the other end of it is worth that. And just reminding yourself that you are not defined by those who reject you or by the rejections mm -hmm. you've received. Because oftentimes we take in those rejections as if they are a judgment of our intelligence, our, our looks, our character, our potential. And those are simply judgments based on whatever circumstances that that person's involved in, or if it's, you know, in terms of college, it's whatever circumstances they've defined as criteria for this particular year. But if we have to look at things from a different perspective of just because I'm rejected here doesn't mean that I am a rejected person. And so really picking yourself back up and, and hope Hope is really the most beautiful part of rejection because at the end of the day, if we can pull through it and not allow it to define us, there is hope of there's going to be a time where you're not rejected. And it's picking yourself back up and putting yourself back in those positions again. I yeah, I just want to reiterate uh, something you stated, which I think is so beautiful, that being rejected is not does not make you a rejected person, right? Like your rejection is not a definition of you. It's merely you're just you're just not right for that person, that job, that college, that whatever it is in this moment. I spent 20 years in executive search and we used to always say that there's no bad candidates. They're just wrong candidates for certain jobs at certain moments. So like if you are an expert in environmental policy and I'm looking for somebody to do work in, um, I don't know, uh, 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 abuse, you know, domestic abuse uh, victims and social you know, social services and a domestic uh, violence shelter, you're not going to be the right person. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean that you're not an amazing environmental policy person. You're just not right for this particular thing right now at this time. But it does feel super definitional. And I feel like that causes us to like wear other people's clothes to try to pretend like we're someone else like okay well they don't like me like this maybe i'll go get become a little expert like that or maybe i'll imitate the way this person talks or the way that that person makes jokes and we try on personalities to see like what will fit and then that makes us i think probably less relatable right because i think like people can smell a fake i think they can tell yes. that somebody's not being real so 
but what's the balance between like, I want to figure out to sort of stretch and be uncomfortable and maybe try to be find the funny part of myself or find the vulnerable part of myself or find the the daring part of myself or the or the or the quieter part of myself but I don't want to be fake also so how do we sure. figure out who we are that's a great question. And I think that really speaks to the different selves of authenticity, where I think when people say the word authentic, we think that there's one version. I have 17 personalities. You know, I have the personality that, that can show up on live TV and never curse. I have the personality that you grab a drink with me. I may end up cursing like a sailor at some point. These are definitely all parts of who I am. Which is why we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like I just, I, but I can, I show up differently in different situations because the circumstances can can provide for that. And so those are all me. The challenges and the problem is is when when you are out of alignment. Those moments are all in alignment with who I am, but there are so many times where you can feel yourself adapting to a, a situation where you are pretending to be different. Mm -hmm. And that's really, it's a feeling. It's an innate emotion. There is there is a physical reaction that happens for, for many people when they are pretending to be someone else. They get the feeling in their chest, the feeling in their stomach, something in their head, and we all have different indicators. And so it's really paying attention. Again, I, I always go back to self-awareness because I think the more aware that we are of our feelings, our reactions, our bodies, our emotions, or our physicality, the more that we can start to understand how we're showing up in these different situations. And the one thing that you were, you were talking about is that I, I just really aligned with so much was thinking about how we do change to try to fit in certain situations. And oftentimes we do that to get the job, to make the connection, to you know have a better date. But maybe the person on the other side of the table is not for you. Maybe the other the person in that job is not for you. I, I tell a story in my book and and in a lot of my keynotes where I was a lawyer uh, before I got into all of this, and I was working at a very high end law firm uh, in in law school, and I felt the need to hide my child. Mm. I had to hide a kid. To, to fit in in this, in this situation because that was the environment that I was in. And now in retrospect, I thought, wow, I mean, if you feel the need to hide such an important part of yourself, maybe that's just not your environment. And maybe not everybody's hiding children out there, but maybe they're hiding parts of themselves. And that protection that can come from being you can lead you to the places and people that are actually for you. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, you know, there's one of the, like, there's so many, like, just bullshit um, Instagram memes that are out there. And one of them is like, if it's for you, it will be for you. Or like, it'll find, if it's for you, it'll find you and all that stuff. But I think that, I think the opposite is true, right? That we do try to force our mess into everybody else's pretty so that we can be part of the pretty. And then we get there and we're like, well, why do I feel bad? Like, why does this suck? Well, because I don't, like, I I'm not the kind of, person who's going to work at the firm and then go out to happier and then do all these things on the weekend. Like I actually I have a kid and I like being a mom and I want to hang out with my kid and I want to do these things and I want to talk about my kid. And like, I want this to be part of my life, but I'm so busy cramming my mess into everyone else's pretty. And I mean, you know, whatever, I wrote a whole book about this, right? <laughs> You're like trying to, you know, have other people's definitions of success and then it doesn't actually work. And that's really hard, but there's this idea on social media that authentic is just like, I'm going to show up without makeup on my Insta feed today. <laughs> Look how authentic I am. And like, that's not... That's not authentic. That's not brave. Like whatever. You've got perfect skin and no wrinkles. Don't tell me you're being brave by showing up with that. <laughs> your authentic self. Wow, amazing. Yeah, I was Talk like, I have concealer 50. and mascara on, and I'm so totally. authentic That's today. Seventeen layers. I'm here, and it's so yeah, absolutely. Um, but but um, but but so that's really interesting because I mean, you know, when we connect to somebody, you can't connect to somebody if you're somebody else on the other like you have to be you or it's not actually a connection like you can have a great connection with somebody who is going to the happy hour and doesn't have a kid and wants to talk about you know their dating life and then there you are and you're like okay I'm, we're, we're connecting but you're connecting to the pretend Rachel you're not connecting to the real Rachel exactly yeah I always say if, if, if they don't actually know the real you how do they really like you how do they really love you because they don't know you so it's so important. And again, it's you may lead to rejections because you're showing up as yourself, because you're showing all of your sides. 
But I do believe that rejection is protection at, in many circumstances where you're not, you're not supposed to be in a situation where that is your person or that is your friend or that is your, your ideal job. So, yeah. And, and we really are building so many of these relationships based on false pretenses. And there's only yes. so long that you can be someone that you're not. And that's why, you know, when we talk about romantic relationships, I always say to people, you can definitely go get married in a couple months, but you don't know that person. And it takes 18 from psychological research. It takes 18 months for people to start to feel comfortable enough to show all of their sides. And so often we don't allow that. And then we end up in situations where we've committed to, to people and we don't know them. So, okay. I think this is very interesting during the pandemic. So I wonder if it takes longer for people now to show each other all of their sides or because we have a little bit of distance and maybe people are like talking on the phone for hours and hours and hours or writing long emails or text texting back and forth. I wonder if they're showing more of that um, because there's almost this illusion of like protection. When my husband and I were first dating, um, it was, you know, obviously before cell phones and, you know, running water, but we had email and we would send each other long emails. We were in like, you know, you know, early peon jobs, we didn't really have to like be totally present. So we'd send each other long emails, like in the middle of the afternoon, paragraphs after paragraphs. It was like, you know, our version of written love letters. And I, I think that I might've been more open about stuff that I was thinking about or who I was or my hopes and dreams, because I didn't have to see his reaction right in front of me. And I wonder if the pandemic's going to make people, um, slow them down in terms of getting to know each other because they're not interacting the same way, or it's actually going to allow them to be more vulnerable sooner. I'm curious what your thinking is on that. So there's actually been research on two points of this regarding uh, just how COVID has changed the way that we approach relationships. One is uh, where people are reprioritizing what they're looking for and how they are showing up. You know, I, from the dating side of, of things, romantic side, uh, we've seen research over and over again that says that people are really far more intentional. They're less focused on physical attributes. They're really focusing on getting to know people. And people really did connect and fall in love virtually. And so I, going to that other part of it where you do have this kind of false sense of security because you're behind a screen, we see this on both sides of the coin, right? So we well, see Well, that's this. true too. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. In terms of cyberbullying, right, right. Yeah. Trolls, so course. think about that from that perspective. We've seen that over and over again where you would never say some of these things to someone's face. You put these, these people who are sitting around and, and write comments, nasty comments on random people on the internet's videos and pictures, they would never say that face to face. Right. Because they'd get punched. Uh, so <laughs> well, they should. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we've seen it on that side, but we've also seen it on the where people feel this possibility of being more vulnerable. And that's never going to change. But we have had so much more communication virtually and people have felt like I can actually engage and connect in this way. And so it's really beneficial. Um now, especially because we are able to be in person, whether we're talking about a professional or a personal relationship, it doesn't, it can't sustain itself completely virtually. But when you're able to build a foundation from that remote space and then meet and then connect in person, that's why I think you've seen it too, like people going to conferences now and, and really building those relationships are like, they've had this buildup where a lot of these people they've been connecting with offline or are online and then now are offline, it's taking those relationships to that next stage too, which is pretty awesome to see. So there's an interesting foundation that was built and I actually love it um, because I always have to find some sort of silver lining for what we just went through. Yes. Uh, so if it, came, if it came out that people are gonna be a little bit more authentic, a little more vulnerable and prioritize better, I'm a, I'm a kick, I'm gonna put that in the win column. <laughs> I, I put that in the win column too. I, I wrote a blog post in the early days of COVID um, talking about how people should drop the green screen. Like you should drop the green mm. screen from behind you. You should drop the green screen in your life. And I ended up um, being interviewed on Good Morning America um, for it. And I did a whole like green screen thing where Robin Roberts saw me and I was like in front of, you know, like palm trees in a pool. And she's like, no, wait a minute. And I was like, and then I dropped it. And it was like my bookshelf. <laughs> and all of a sudden, instead of like seeing me in this like weird, you know, Miami Beach, you know, Airbnb, I was, you could see the books I was reading. You would see the pictures of my kids behind me. You can see like my little knickknacks, my baby shoes. Like then you start to get to know me, right? And suddenly I become 
relatable, right? So mm-hmm. I, I, I think that one of the silver linings for me, at least in COVID, is that I learned that what we're all selling, whether we're selling products or goods or services or speaking or books or whatever the thing is, or even just ourselves as like a life partner, right? A romantic partner is we're selling trust. And that yeah. trust really comes from showing ourselves. And so this green screen that we all like race to put up behind us, I think is kind of reflective of the green screen that we've been putting up in our lives itself. And I think that's really like the heart of people pleasing, right? Like we want everyone to think like everything's perfect and it's pretty and we're good and we show up and, and, and you talk a lot about people pleasing in your book as one of the, you know, most damaging parts of, 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 to you and in a relationship. So I know a lot of people suffer with people pleasing. And especially now as we're coming out of this pandemic and suddenly there's tons of invitations to go places and do things. And everyone's got like varying degrees of comfort with that. How do we handle our inner people pleaser? (laughs) Oh, yes, it is. It really is so damaging. It's not just damaging for you and the way that you feel, but it's damaging for the relationships that you're actually involved in it with. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, one of the biggest things with people pleasing is understanding where it came from. And typically it's, it's from a fear of abandonment we please so that they don't leave. And that happens professionally, romantically in friendships. You know, this isn't something that that one type of relationship is immune to. And so what I see over and over is that they, they please to, to depletion and we, then resentment builds and all of these things. And so part of it is going back to self-awareness. I sound like a broken record, but it's being aware of, you know, how do you feel when you say yes? How do you feel when you are doing the things that you are doing? Because oftentimes we disconnect as a protective mechanism from the feelings that we have so that we don't get to that nasty place of resentment. And so the more that we can start to be aware of, you know, that didn't feel good. It didn't feel good when I said yes to something I didn't want to do. And maybe it's not going to feel good when I say no, but that is a muscle that can grow. Because the no is still going to feel better than the yes. Yes. And so a little bit of discomfort. It's kind of like the gym. Listen, you haven't missed the gym for the last two years. You show up for the first time and you work out. (laughs) It's going to hurt. It's going to (laughs) hurt. Yeah. But guess what? You keep going back and you keep doing the same thing and you keep growing those muscles. All of a sudden, it's a lot easier to handle. And you might push yourself one day and say no to something even more important. And it might hurt again, but that that muscle grows and you're able to just take back your power. Mm. When you take back that power from saying yes to everything and doing things for the benefit of other people versus yourselves with disrespect to yourself in the process, all of a sudden you start to grow that that muscle to a place where it's a lot easier to differentiate between what am I doing for other people versus what am I doing because I want to. So what if your love language is acts of service or giving gifts, right? Yeah. What if like, you, what if you, you cause I, I mean, I have a dear friend who his love language is, is gifts, giving gifts, which, you know, is great. Like he's a friend of mine. He gives him gifts. It's wonderful. <laughs> but I, I also, I often will sort of chastise him when I see him do it in relationships because I'm like, you know, you you he he gives the gift as a way to just like check i'm making you feel better i feel better it's good i've done something and i'm like no and you talk a lot in your book about presence over presence right which yeah. is fantastic as somebody who like again my 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 um love language acts of service and also quality time like i like mm. to just like be like i i go to the funeral like i'm there i'm the person i show up i'm a show up kind of person um but i think that the the sort of the gift giving and the like sometimes that is a lot of people pleasing, but I also wonder if like maybe my ex of service, maybe my get like all of our love languages are also the way that we please other people. But what if it also like, what if we get identity from being the person who pleases people? Yeah. And that, that's something to be aware of the balance. And especially if it is your love language and you know that there's still going to come to a place where it doesn't feel as good anymore. So it's really understanding and, and knowing that, you know, not that relationships are, you know, you have to equal out. Like if I give you this, I get this back. But if it doesn't feel like a give and take, that is something that we energetically feel and we know it. And so if we're consistently just saying, you know, I, it's okay because it's my, my, my love language, you know, this, this is what I do at some point. It still doesn't feel good. 
And I'm a big, I, listen, I could sit here and talk about mushy feelings all day because they do guide us. And if we're not paying attention to how I feel when I do this and how I feel and, and how I feel in terms of, am I being reciprocated, you know, and really looking at it with eyes wide open. And that's another situation when it comes to relationships, especially romantic and friendship relationships, mm -hmm. you know, when it's an uneven relationship, yes. we know this <laughs> and yes. sometimes we plow through it. Because of fear, fear of loss, fear of abandonment, feel it, feel all of these other fears that can come up in these situations. Mm -hmm. But we know when it's not even. We know when we're being taken advantage of. And so there's a big difference between you taking care of somebody that you love that also responds with your love language versus I'm just going to give and give and give because I'm, I'm saying it makes me feel good, but I still don't feel good because this is a very unreciprocated relationship. Well, and then there's the rejection, not the rejection. There, the, the rejection is also part of it, but there's the resentment piece of mm. it, right? And the resentment piece obviously is tinged with rejection, but there's the like, I showed up, I showed up, I showed up, or I gave and I gave and I gave. And then when I needed something, it was like crickets, right? Yeah. Like, where are they? You have all those people that are like friends in the good times. And like, what about when, what about when, you know, shit goes sideways? Like, where are they then? And the ones who show up and the ones who, you know, are there. And, um, but it's, it's really heartbreaking mm. when they don't. And, and, you know, my husband, um, he, I think if he could like wave a magic wand and fix any of my like flawed character traits, as he might describe them, that would be one. The fact that I just like, I run towards the foxhole every single time. I'm going to jump on the grenade every single time. And then I'm going to be disappointed when people don't miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Like, it's just going to break my heart. And he's like, but you know, you know, like, why did you do it? You knew they weren't going to show up that you knew that they were going to break your heart. But I think that there's like, there's two options, right? You can either be that person and have mm. your heart broken over and over and over again. And then also like have joy, incredible, immense joy, or you could, crawl back into a hole and not show up for people and not do it. And so, you know, I mean, you talked about hope being like incredible. Like I, 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 I think being able to find that reserve of hope to like continue to just be idealistic. Like I just believe that given the choice, people will do the right thing, even though 80% of the people have shown me they won't. There's like 20%. <laughs> it's like your sample size needs to grow. Yeah. It's you know, not working. It's not, but, but, <laughs> but I mean, like, is that, is that, is that sort of the key to relationships is like stopping and thinking, well, who are those 20% that do show up and what are their traits? Like what kinds of people are they? What sets them apart? And maybe like, it might not be like, yeah, we want to connect to anyone anywhere, but also do we want to more deeply connect to like a certain subset and how do we figure out who, like, who are our people? You talk about toxic people in the book, but there's a lot of people that are like only kind of like minorly poisonous, right? They're not like, <laughs> huge, like, like you know, you. <laughs> we all know to like, we got to get rid of like an abusive relationship or a screaming boss. We know like they're like that, but what about the ones that are just like slowly drip, 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 like energy vampires, the ones that suck us dry over time? Yes. Uh, well, which can be just as dangerous as the people who are so evidently toxic. I and think the one thing so. I want to, yeah, because it's yeah. like, you didn't realize you were being drained. Yes. Um, uh, but the, the one thing, um, that I, one of my favorite things to remind people is to not expect you from other people. And that's oh. one, one thing. Oh, oh, I feel so attacked. Oh, <laughs> gosh. oh man, that's a mic drop right there. Not to expect yeah. you from other people. And expectations are pretty much the root of every frustration that we have. So mm. it's okay to show up and continue to get the joy and really embrace those 20%, but it's those expectations that crush us. So if we can keep those in check, we can tend to lessen the suffering. It doesn't mean that it completely goes away. But yeah, oftentimes we think we would do this. So why wouldn't everybody else do it? But that's never the case or very infrequently the case. Man, no, you're right. You're right. You are you. I mean, that is that is absolutely right. And and um, I'm going to I'm going to print that out in like 48 point font and tape it to the like the top of my 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 computer screen. That was that never expect you from other people because, yeah, I mean, it is it is it is it is the misaligned expectations. Um, yeah. with anything, right? With like, yeah. I mean, if you're like building a house and you're a contractor and you have misaligned expectations, it's going to be pretty annoying. So what, what, 
what's interesting about this book, like so many books are about, you know, how do you, how do you build relationships? How do you, you know, meet lots of people? How do you go out and like create like funnels and CRMs and, you know, sell to lots of people, but yours is about how do you make yourself relatable, right? Like what's the inner work that we have to do? And I know you have like some pillars on which becoming more relatable rests. So let's talk a little bit about your three pillars. Sure. Yeah. I, uh, it's connect, communicate, inspire. And I joke around. I was like, I, I love when people are able to fit some sort of lesson into alliterations. I love some alliterations. And I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I have Kakai. Kakai is my, <laughs> <laughs> so if we can get to Kakai. We're good, but yeah. It's Kakai. Really yes. <laughs> I like <Yeah>. it. <laughs> I had one audience shout that at the end of the, my speech. I was like, this is the best day ever. <laughs> It's like you sound like a bunch of dying birds. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it really is. Because here's the deal is it, you can try to figure out what's the external things that I need to do. What are the the things that I need to say and, and give scripts? I mean, there's there's a ton of books that tell you, <laughs> it's like, sorry, Phil, exactly what to say. Yes, yes, <laughs> and, and, sorry, and, Phil. <laughs> which is an amazing book as well. And I love those tools. And for me, because my journey was inner work, because my journey really led me to this place through going through these pillars myself, sometimes the hard way, is what I found was really kind of this transformational moment of how you can show up differently and create better relationships by being better. You know, I'm not, we don't have to be perfect, but if we can actually just be better than we were yesterday and show up in a different way, then things are starting to change. So, and we, we did dive into a lot of the, the connection, which is really that authenticity piece and, and finding all of those selves and being okay with it. Uh, right. So it's then, not just being better. It's being better at being you. Yeah. 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 I because how great does that feel? It, it's, you know, it's one thing to show up with other people differently and and try to be a certain, you know, way with other people. And, and there are definitely parts of that, especially with communicate. Communicate is far more about how you show up with other people and, and the things that you can do to be better there. Um, but a lot of it's aligning more with yourself. Because if we don't have a good relationship with ourselves and we don't really look at some of the things that are holding us back from the way that we show up, then you can memorize everything to say, uh, but it's not going to land the same. So before we get to communicate, can we talk a little bit about another C, confidence? Because, yes. you know, we can talk all day long about like, be a better you and show up and be authentic. But like, that's scary as fuck when you're like, yeah. no one's going to like me. <laughs> No one's going to like me when I'm me. And, you know, I tell audiences all the time that there are all these lies that we tell ourselves standing in between us and like the dreams that we want to have. And one of them is, you know, like, I'm not ready. I might fail. One of them is um, people won't like the me who I am when I'm me I want to be. And I'm like, that one's not a lie. Like the lie isn't that they're, you know, that they're not going to like you. They're a lie is that their opinions actually matter. Right. Yes. So like, if you want to change the people around you, sometimes you have to like change, like change them, like change them out, get new people around you. So, so, so talk a little bit about how do we find once we've decided, like, who really am I? You have a great um, exercise in your book about, you know, writing down your likable traits. Like, why do people like you? And what are your most likable traits? And how, who, who are you when you're the person you enjoy being? But how do we get the confidence and the flyer freak flag out there and be that person? Because <laughs> we all got a freak flag. We all we got do. It. We do. I, it's it's obviously there's there's a lot of steps to this, but one of the first one is really figuring out where do those holes come from, and I call them confidence shaped holes because we have to figure out like where's the Swiss cheese and mm -hmm. why is it there? Because oftentimes, and I've seen this throughout you know the last ten years of doing this is. Once people even recognize like, oh my gosh, it's because of, you know, this, this terrible relationship or this situation that I went through or, you know, job loss or whatever it is that damaged you and damaged that, that, that part of you that says now I'm not enough in that situation. Once we can recognize it, oftentimes that's healing in itself because we don't pay attention to it until we have to. And so even just that reflection point of saying, where did this come from? How can I start to recognize it and, and work through it? And sometimes that's with the help of a therapist, a coach, self-reflection, depending on the level of severity. And then that next step is, yeah, one of the things is really recognizing, what am I amazing at? How can I boost myself up? I'm a huge fan of uh, of mantras. I include a self-hypnosis with the book because mm -hmm. I, I am a hypnotherapist and 
I found that really programming the subconscious, our subconscious mind is brilliant. <laughs> so whatever you think about yourself, uh, your, your subconscious mind has got it going on. And the more that we can start to remind ourselves, we start to change those, those patterns. We start to change those parts of our brain that are against us. And so it's really a practice and confidence is a constant practice. And it doesn't mean that, you know, we, no one's getting to that top of that mountain and staying there. We're always going to get kicked down at times and having a practice allows us to bring ourselves back up. So utilizing those mantras, utilizing recognition. Uh, and I do believe, and so does science, in certain elements of fake it till you make it. I'm not saying that you can pretend, I'm not waking up to pretend to be a 20 year old supermodel, you know, but I can pretend, you know, to have certain different elements that, you know, I can step into. You know, maybe it is just a little bit more powerful in certain situations. Maybe it is being a little bit better with conflict. Ironically, I'm a lawyer who hates conflict and it really makes it, it gives me anxiety. Like yeah. I'm talking about, I, I didn't want to call our, our appliance delivery person to change the, the service date because I was afraid they were going to get upset with me because I fought to get it <laughs> in two days. And now I'm like, eh, I can't take it now. And like that conflict makes me anxious. So I can embrace a different person and step into that and then engage in that that conversation differently. So there's there's absolutely different elements where we can practice confidence in a way that starts to resonate and starts to stick. Yeah, I I I mean it's very, you know, Todd Herman alter ego effect and Yes. And, you know, before we were before we started recording, we talked about my giant yellow outfit that I wore on stage in front Loved of 5,000 people in Dallas, my first real big like gig back. And I had spoken to 2,500 people before that, but never 5,000. And I was literally preceded on stage by like women with t-shirt cannons, like throwing t-shirts out into the audience. <laughs> and there's like thumping DJs. Yes. And it was terrifying. And I'm backstage and I'm literally dressed from head to toe bright yellow. And I walk out on stage and I'm like, I can't play small and head to toe yellow. So I was like, hello, Dallas, here I am. And they roared back at me. And because they roared back, I roared back at them. And it was almost like I just had to pretend I didn't have to fake it till I made it for 60 full minutes on stage and get like a thunderous roaring of a, a, a standing ovation. My first of my life, by the Yay! way. <laughs> Yay! I only had to be brave for like 16 seconds when I walked out on stage. And then th because I was brave and courageous, they were brave and courageous back and got louder. And so I was back. And it was like we fed off of each other almost. So I was mm. immediately like relatable to them because I was so in their energy. And then they yes. responded. And so we were oh. able to just have this incredible like courage cycle of growth. And like, but I would have thought if I was standing backstage, I'm going to have to fake it and be like LGO on stage for 60 <laughs> minutes. But I didn't. As soon as I was just LGO for 16, they took it from there. And it was this really incredible um, realization for me that you, 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 you can step into this person you want to be but you, 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 all you need, you don't, you don't need to be fully there. You just kind of need the momentum. You just need like the, yes. the first step. You know, like yep. when you jump out of an airplane, you don't fall down and go splat. Like you remember, oh yeah, they taught me to like pull the ripcord on the parachute. So you do it and you're fine. But like someone's going to have to push my ass out of that plane because I'm going to be terrified. You know, it's like yeah. you just need the like the beginning almost to get there. Yep. Just got to get the wheels on the track. Once yeah. they start moving, I love that. Yeah, you stepped into it. And that yes. happens so often when people are thinking, oh my gosh, that fear of getting started, that fear of taking that first step is normally the, the biggest fear point that you're ever going to face. And then once you're in it, it becomes so much easier. And yes. it doesn't mean that like there, there's not going to be uncomfortable moments. And you and I, I'm, I'm sure you, I, I know I've had this and I can't speak for you actually, <laughs> where you're, you're in it. And then something throws you out of it. You know, it could be during a speech, could be in an interview. I've had this happen on live television where I was like yes. in it, in it, in it. And I was feeling it. And then all of a sudden, like something distracts me like squirrel. And then I'm like, oh, oh no. And then you have to put, but you can put yourself back in it. Like yes. once you've had it on the track, you can get yes. back on the track. Yes. But it is, it is terrifying, right? It's this terrifying moment. Yeah. But that, I mean, but that, like I walked off that stage and I was like, oh, 
those are my people. The yes. way that, that speech felt <laughs> was very different than every other speech I've ever given. Now I need to go yeah. out and find more clients like that, right? So it was like 80%, yes. 20%. Now I found like, where do I go? And like, who, yeah. like, who, like, who am I for? Like, who are my people? So, so this, this yeah. confidence thing, I, I, I think is super interesting because it's not like I'm going to be confident. So everybody loves me. It's going to be like, I'm going to be confident and show my real me so that the people who are for me actually show themselves, right? They appear to me, which is, yes. you know, yeah, I think sometimes we're pretty just neat. Have to yeah, sift like flour. Not all of it's meant to be with you. So it's and and so often yes. I think that we have this. Listen, everybody has the desire to be liked. I don't care. There's so many people out there like I don't care what people think. I don't need anybody to like me. Guess what? You still do. Your inner child is in there saying, "Yes, I do. Yes, please like me. <laughs> yeah, stop lying." <laughs> yes. So yes. you know we all have that. It's just how much do we allow it to control us? And when you yes. take the knob back and you take the wheel back, then all of a sudden it's okay. It's not going to always feel great that other people don't like you or that, yes. you know, these people do fall away, but the people who are left, they, they matter and They're they make really a your people. huge impact. Yes. Okay. So now how do we communicate with them? You have got connect, communicate, inspire. <laughs> so how do we communicate? Yeah. Communication. So I've always said that communication is energetic and there's so many people that speak about, you know, specifics about communication and, and there's entire books and research studies done on it. But to me, it's all about our energy and how we show up. Just how you just said, you communicated with that audience by your energy as you stepped out on that stage, by the tone, by how you, how you stood, how you said everything, those first moments, and it was all energetic. And that's really what I find makes the biggest impact. And we talked a little bit or mentioned it before about, you know, the presence and really understanding how we are lacking in that, mm. in this, in this day and age. And it is becoming far more problematic as we go along, because I, I always say, I'm like, we don't have phone. This isn't a phone anymore. This is a tiny computer that's attached to me at all times. And so we're, we're attached to, to these notifications and calls and, and our presence is distracted in every direction. But the, the way that we show up in conversation is what's going to dictate the outcome of it. And so utilizing kind of just that understanding of our presence is, is a huge, huge part of this and obviously can go further into that. But, you know, the other element of communication that I think is just so important is that adaptability of let me not change who I am, but understand how people need to be treated and understand how people best receive communication. You mentioned the love languages before. Well, we all have different kind of love languages for the way that we enjoy communication. You mentioned you're an introvert. If I show up, I am pretty extroverted and until I completely deplete myself and then I need to hide in like a cave for a while, um, which does happen. But I'm pretty extroverted. If I show up and like I am just in your face and you know, rah, rah, the moment I met you before you have any sort of context, we're all of a sudden just eliminating that possibility of an initial connection. You're yes. terrified of like, please go away. Terrified, yes. Yeah. I'm gonna be like, I'm sorry. Did I hear the roof just came in? I've got to go. I'm kind of like, <laughs> can yes. I go get a root canal, please? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't even need the Novocaine. Just yeah, just whatever. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that's that. That is, it, it is true. And so, you know, I've uh, I have a, a friend, uh, Scott Stratton, who you may know, who's a, a in the sort of speaking I know of world. Him. Yeah, yes. Scott is absolutely incredible. And Scott gets on stage and he walks out in his t-shirt and his jeans and his man bun. And he like walks out and he kind of is like, uh, so uh, you want to talk, should we talk about the man bun now or later? And it's like his like <laughs> beginning joke. And it's like, he just walks out like kind of quiet and unassuming. And eventually throughout the talk, he gets like bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And he's like Rah! screaming by the end. And one time I was like, well, how do you, how do you, how do you do that? And he's like, oh, well, I, I can't come out on stage and give them the full Stratton immediately because whew. That's going to be too much. <laughs> so there is this thing about communicating where, you know, you've talked about self-awareness a few times. And Dr. Tasha Yurik, uh, who's uh, brilliant, uh, uh, writes, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's something like if you ask people if they're self-aware, like 80% of them will say that they are, but like 90% <laughs> of them will say nobody else is, right? Like the math just doesn't add up. So, um, I, so, so how do we figure out like how to... I don't know, titrate our 
introversion or extroversion are like full stratton to like we go out there. There's a there's a comment here from um Aaron. Uh, it's a, a long comment. I won't read the whole thing, but basically the gist of it is that um, corporate culture is driven by conformity. We bring in these external consultants to tell us the things that probably people inside have already said or have wanted to say or just couldn't be heard. So how do we figure out how to be self-aware enough and understand what's happening with our 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 date, our spouse, our boss, our you know sales, you know uh, target the, to figure out how to you know give them the soft stratton and then the full stratton. <laughs> <laughs> I need to watch the full stratton now. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's yeah, pretty good. it was like I'll caffeinate first and then observe. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> You know, it's really, I think there's two steps that if you're going to cut it down to two things that, that really would make an impact is one is observation. So, so mm. often we enter into com conversations into environments and we come in with our own agenda. However, we don't take a beat and observe. And so if we actually took a minute and observed versus engaged, we'll be able to see things a little bit differently. And I saw a comment before about um, neurotypical, and I do want to caveat yes. that, yes, I understand that in many cases for neurodivergence, this can be difficult and it's going to take a lot more concentration and effort. And in some cases, you know, and we could dive into the, the minutia of, of, of that, but in a lot of situations, you can just take that moment and read the room and try to observe body language and conversations and, and the way that people are engaging so that we have an idea. And then the biggest hack I could ever give people of being able to understand other human beings without offending them with your energy <laughs> or your agenda is getting curious about them. Curiosity to me is one of the greatest superpowers that we could have. And it's something that everybody can learn to do better uh, because maybe we ask questions, but a lot of times, and I see this, it, I see this in job interviews, you know, job interviews, dates where it's, it's an interrogation. <laughs> and listen, that is not enjoyable for anyone. But when you're curious about someone and you're curious about getting to know someone, if you're curious about their thoughts on something, you are so naturally curious in our conversation right now that I feel really important. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> but that happens so often where, you know, we just don't, we don't engage in a way that makes the other person feel like they matter. And our curiosity about them, about who they are, about what they're doing, about their thoughts and beliefs and all of these things can really hack the conversation because one, it gets them talking. The yes. person who rates the rates the conversation the highest is the one who talked the most, according to research. So mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. like, it, you have to do less work, uh, but it naturally makes that person really engage in a different way. And so you can show up differently and be curious about them, and then they'll react to the conversation in a completely different manner. It's, it is incredible to me. I spent 20 uh, years doing executive search and um, I, the, I, I was about a year into the search work, just like a, you know, peon just doing the like smile and dial and trying to build the candidate pools. And I remember one day, one of the vice presidents of the firm walked in after, you know, a long day out of the office. And I was like, Hey, Lisa, how you doing? You look, are you okay? Like she looked she looked terrible. Like she looked like she just got out. Like <laughs> her tell puppy her got run over. No, but I was just like, "Are you all right?" Like she looked. She looked like 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 her puppy got run over by a bus. I was like, "What?" She looked oh. shattered, and I was like, "What? Are you all right? What's going on?" And she's like, "Oh, I'm just tired. I've been listening all day." And I remember oh. at the ripe old age of like 25, being like, "Listening, <laughs> whatever. Like, <laughs> how hard is that?" And then I learned how to listen, like really mm -hmm. listen, like listen to what people say, listen to what they don't say, listening to the pause, watching their eye contact, their body language, how they get, you know, speak faster or slower depending on the topic. And I was like, oh, there's a whole world. <laughs> oh, wow. And now, and I don't know, maybe that just made me more introverted because it's exhausting. But, um, <laughs> I, but, but I also can tell you that in those 20 years, when I would ask the search committee, which candidates they liked the most, the ones where the candidates did the least talking and they did the most talking were the ones that they liked the most. And I was like, okay, I need to train my search committees how to listen better. But really getting people talking and opening them up and then asking that follow-up question, mm. like, well, tell me why, like, tell me a little bit more about that or how did that feel or what did that look like later? And they like, like asking them the questions that they're not used to answering and like, mm. then like, waiting, like counting in your head, like one, 
too. Oh my gosh. After they stop talking. Yes. And then they and then it's like they're just like verbal vomit, like <laughs> everything in the world. And that's when you really, that's when you really get to know them. That's the best. Oh my gosh, the uncomfortable silences. If people just recognize you don't have to fill all that space. It was something I learned as a baby lawyer because we do depositions and they'd always say, like, take the silence. The silence is okay because if you ask the question and you just shut up and you allow them to talk, yes. people just want to talk. They just start talking and they have yes. no control over it. So, I mean, I guess we could <laughs> use this for this. We're not using this for bad anymore, but yeah, it was just people are so uncomfortable with silence that they'll fill it somehow. So take the beat. Like you don't have to then fill in something else. Ask the question, take the beat, and then let them talk. It's it is it is truly incredible. And the you know the other the other thing is like you know not asking people like how can I help you right, but like what do you need? What do you need yeah. to you know for support? And then like you learn about parts of it that they don't they they wouldn't actually have told you. Like you know I I, I had a conversation just before this about um, what I needed to get like the next book out the door, and the person asked me. Um, how, you know, how can I support you? And I was like, you know, I don't even actually know the answer to that yet. Like, I can't, mm. I can't tell you what I need to do on our call next week in order to be able to answer that question. So I guess what I need is I need to actually write out a, a like the schedule and the deadline of what I need to do when, and then I, so like it helped me get to that place yep. of, you know, something that was different. And so our relationship will now be different because now she's going to support me in this way, as opposed to me feeling like I just need to people please. And like, just like keep giving her, you know, deliverables along the way, but it's actually going to be much deeper. And so that, 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 uh, that also gives me more confidence. Right. Okay. So what about inspire? Uh, inspire is my favorite part. And it's such a funny thing. When I, when I started to write about it, I was like, people are going to be like, wait, I picked up a relationship building book and they're talking about your inspiration and, and your why essentially. And your then your, I call it your then what, because we do all of this that we've been talking about. We, you know, we get the connection, we get the job, we get the raise, we, we get the likes and the comments and whatever it is that we're building. And then what, because if we don't have purpose, we don't have the potential to grow and we don't have the potential to take that relationship to the next level. So inspire is really what's within us that is going to draw people in. It's kind of, you know, it's proactive versus reactive. When you are inspirational, when you have your then what figured out, you're reacting to people versus having to seek it out because people are naturally drawn to you and they're drawn to knowing that this person is, is shining a little brighter. And so really figuring out what is my then what, what is the reason why I'm doing all this? Why, why am I reading this book? Why am I listening to this person? Why do I want to build those relationships? Is it because, you know, I I'm here to just have a specific end goal. Is it, is it monetary? Is it, is it security? Is it, you know, for me, I, I had a long, windy path to get to where I am now. And I don't think that I was as relatable when I was just, you know, putting my time in and collecting mm -hmm. a paycheck and, you know, kind of filling, checking those boxes, but without that purpose attached to it. And now it's, no, I, I know my purpose. I know my purpose is to build connection. And it shows up in everything that I do, hopefully. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. so what if your purpose is just, what if your purpose is just merely transactional in that one transaction? Can we still be relatable? I think you can. I just don't think it's as impactful. I, I do believe, and it doesn't mean, so one of the things I talk about is it doesn't, knowing your purpose or knowing your then what doesn't mean that this is some divinely inspired. You don't get this, you know, when you, you've you had a 17 hour meditation and it, it comes to you. Um, if you did and that happens, super cool, like take it. Um, but I think there are moments where you're defining your purpose for those transactions. You're defining your purpose mm -hmm. for those those in encounters. And that's okay. It's just, you know, really being clear on what that intention is because that intention will direct how you drive that boat. And so I, I do believe that you can, you can do it for that transaction, but then really assessing right after that, okay, let, let's look at the bigger picture again, because yes. the more that you have that North star, I view it as like that North star to me, when you really figure out what your then what is, and doesn't mean that it has to be the same one for the rest of your life. Sometimes it is, but when you have that North star, you know where you're going, you know, overall in terms of how am I, am I directing this and directing my life? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love that. I, you know, when I, when things started opening back up again and I started going to stores and interacting with people, I would like take a moment, I'd look at their name tag and it would be like, thank you, Rachel. 
I hope you have a great day. You know, I, I, I was, it was transactional. I'm checking out of the grocery store, but I still would like take that moment, say the person's name, like have like allow them to be seen, allow them to see me. Right. Like just have that connection. Cause I feel like we all sort of lost that, that, that interrelatability. And I just like, for me, like it was, it was a transactional checking out the grocery store, but it was, it was, I'm remembering how to human again. Right? I'm remembering mm, how to people. And yeah. if I can remember how to people with the checkout clerk at the grocery store, then maybe I can remember how to people with like, you know, the cocktail party that I'm going to or the client that yeah. I have to talk to or, you know, like all the things that I'm doing. And so I think even in the smallest transactions, there are moments to have a then what that has a purpose that affects us in other things. And so I love that that question of like what the purpose is. And it doesn't have to be higher or lofty, but it just it's just yours. So Motivation. this is... Yes, you, your motivation. This is this is incredible. I could I could talk to you all day. I think you are um, fantastic, and I can understand why you are so successful as a relationship coach. Teach people how to be relatable because this was a very easy conversation. Um, but I know that people have loved this. I've gotten a ton of comments and tweets about it as we're talking. So people want to find you. How can people find you? How can they find your book, Relatable? <laughs> how do we get How do we get more Rachel D'Alto in our lives? Oh gosh, there's there's a limit there, <laughs> or limitless, <laughs> or yes, it could be limitless. Yes, <laughs> I see uh, what you did I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel D'Alto everywhere. Websites racheldialto.com, and uh, this is my favorite thing to say. It's like you can find the book anywhere books are sold. <laughs> I love that. I'm like anywhere fine books are sold, yes. even in Boise, Idaho, at the Barnes and Noble. Although I did buy the last one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So are you going around to bookstores and just like secretly signing books everywhere? No. You know what? There there may have been a rumor that a housewife did that to like make sure they couldn't send them back. <laughs> Which made me laugh. So That's hard. hilarious. That's like hilarious. it was like a marketing strategy, but you know, I um it's so funny. I I don't even think about it. And I I had a an engagement out in Boise and I normally pack some and I forgot I had like a complete brain fart and so I was able to to go into the Barnes and Noble and buy the last one there and I was like that's just the coolest thing so I maybe yeah. should go to more bookstores well um, I have found that if you go to bookstores and you offer to sign them they do and then they take it and they put them as like a front facing on the shelf ooh. with a little signed signed by the author sticker so a little hack I think there. my and publisher then I don't would know. appreciate that yeah <laughs> I'm, yes. I'm gonna Start this that now, fantastic. four months later. Yeah, start it now. You know what? <laughs> Absolutely. People are going to bookstores again. It's fine. It's true. It's fine. <laughs> Rachel, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. This has been a blast.